start. It's nice to see of see some of uh, recurring names also here. Hi Arun, nice to see you. Once again, I welcome you all to School Synergy Workshop Series. And in today's session, uh, we'll be uh, doing a session on understanding creative writing with our own faculty, uh, Nishevita Jayantra. I am uh, Ruchi Kumar, Assistant Professor at Center for Education, Innovation and Action Research at Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. And uh, I am the anchor of this uh, School Synergy Workshop series. We have been holding it uh, since last year. Last year, it was done in face-to-face -face manner. And this year, since August, uh, we have been doing uh, online workshops uh, every Saturday at 3 p.m. Uh, in these workshops, we try to focus on ideas that can be implemented in classroom practice and teachers can use these ideas and also share their experiences of um, using these practices in their classroom. Uh, so we would be very much interested in knowing also if any of the ideas that you have uh, uh, came across in the School Synergy Workshop series, if you have tried it with your students and have got some experience, please do write it to us at uh, school synergy at the rate uh, tiss dot edu uh, so uh, we also release uh, these uh, uh, one hour workshops on youtube uh, our youtube channel and we have um, the list of all the workshops that were held in this year at our uh, website educational resource center of the center for education and uh, 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 center for education innovation and action research so uh, Nishevita Jayendran, who will be taking the session today, uh, she is a faculty at our center and she has been for last uh, five, six years been engaged in uh, working with uh, developing uh, modules for uh, clicks, which is our large scale action research uh, initiative. And she has extensively worked in literature and um, uh, working with the uh, uh, research scholars and teachers into understanding, uh, getting deeper understanding about literature and creative writing also. So uh, we are very fortunate to have her here. Let's uh, um, go to Nishevita now. Nishi, you can see. Yeah. Mika, uh, you're mute. Yeah. Yeah, now on. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, Ruchi. And uh... Yeah. yeah, thank you all for coming and thanks also for giving me this chance to speak on something that is very close to my heart because I love to read and uh, that's also fortunately a part of my profession. So how many of you all like to read? Maybe we can start by um, seeing if some of you don't have any network issues. Can we have our videos on? Okay, Rachna likes to read. All right. What kinds of work do you like to read, Rachna? You can unmute and speak too. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Yes. yes. Uh, I I like to read um, books on health, basically, mm -hmm. and on nature discoveries. Okay. All right. Any favorite authors you have? No, nothing like that in particular. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Um, you could switch on your videos. It will be nice to have a face to go with the voice. No yes, takers? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, how about others? Are there any favorite kinds of stories or genres or something that you really like or enjoy reading? Hmm. Thanks, Rachna. Yeah. You can also type in the chat. So that's another option we do have. We can try and keep the interactivity going because most of the time we sort of do these uh, sessions face to face. So it's easy to engage and have a more uh, dynamic interaction. But in the absence of that physical interaction, I think we need to make milk the technology space for what it's worth. So there's a chat box available for you, raising hands, unmuting, and the noisier the session, the better it's going to be. So it's okay if three of you speak together and we can build something more creative out of that cacophony perhaps. Uh, yeah, Sandhya, would you like to? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah. <clears throat> so I'm Sandhya and I am um, not uh, much, like I don't read often, but I, I do like to read. So currently I'm just reading uh, Jeffrey Archer's book. I don't really enjoy uh, fiction that much, but um, yeah, I I, I um, kind of read. So I also do like to write, and I'm kind of uh, having a block called Sand on Wheels. Uh, I'm a potter, so so I kind of thought of this because I work on the wheel. Uh, so that's that's uh, one of the things, and I also teach in school. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's called Puna at. Uh, Puna sent uh, Puna learn uh, sorry wait <laughs> I think I'm just <laughs> okay that's all right. All right. it's called Puna okay it's it's called right. Puna and uh, it's it's fun um, interacting with uh, kids and I also want to like you know express myself uh, uh, like bringing all those experience into into a, a kind of a thing where you know I myself can reflect on and read probably and mm -hmm. you know keep it like a memory so that's one of the things that I really wanted to do so I'm looking forward to the interaction and uh, all the tips that I can get from this <laughs> session yeah okay so there's one hour so there's just a, that much that I uh, that we can do together but uh, I think what uh, we're really trying to do here is to kind of get an overview or a larger sense of this understanding of what creative writing is and mm -hmm. how we do it so I really like the way you call your blog a sand on wheels and uh, yeah. maybe it's it's really a creative way of talking about a lump of sand that sort of turns and something comes out of it. So uh, Janavi, you said you like Ruskin Bond and Orhan Pamuk. That's quite a list, especially Pamuk. Is there any particular uh, novel of Pamuk that you like? Uh, hi, um, really happy to be here. Um, there is no particular format because when I started reading, I was actually on a discovery mode. I didn't know what to expect. So I've tried to kind of, you know, read children's uh, storybooks. Mm -hmm. uh, I also like to read uh, nonfiction sometimes. Okay. So it, it, I don't have any favorite favorites, but I like a lot of like, like Orhan Pamuk, I like one of his novels about uh, something he's written about Turkey. Then Ruskin Pond, I love the way he describes nature and the adventures. So uh, yeah, it takes you to another world. It kind of uh, opens up uh, some new possibilities and uh, makes you look at the world differently. So uh, yeah. Okay, actually that's in fact, a lot of what we are going to be sort of delving a little deeper into in this session itself. What you spoke about as taking you into a different world. What does this idea of a world mean and the descriptions of it? So um, what we're going to do maybe now is a very quick exercise, like a really quick fast exercise. I want you to think for a couple of seconds and write in either a word or a phrase, the one word or a phrase that comes to your mind when you think of creative writing. You can type it in the chat or you can just say it out loud on mute and speak. A word or a phrase, phrase that according to you brings to mind, comes to your mind when you think of creative writing. Pagination. Fluidity. Okay. Fascination. All right. Fascination. And Rachna says fluidity. All right. Fluidity in what sense, Rachna? Do you want to uh, think expression? Do you want to push that idea a little further? How would you talk? Uh, you're muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, what I mean is uh, in, during creative writing, we just allow our thoughts to flow, you know, without uh, uh, thinking much. Uh, 
that's what see when we talk to children i'm not an english teacher but i love uh, english okay so in the sense uh, the writing part and all so mm-hmm. therefore when we tell children we just tell them you write don't worry about grammar in the beginning you know just allow your thoughts to flow that's yeah. what i mean your expression to flow okay all right janvi says um, imagination sandhya new delving into another person's mind absolutely and you um, think uh, rachnal's also raised another important point about fluidity and structure like it's all right if and the idea of grammar itself when it comes to creativity for all of us who are language teachers and who are working with teaching how to write and the emphasis on grammar creative writing actually presents a break out of it in a way that's that can be very enabling multiple perspectives yes mamta flexibility originality thinking out of the box mamta would you like to explain uh, maybe uh, tell us a little more about what you uh, consider originality what is original or what can that original thinking out of the box be um mamta if you are able to unmute hello yeah yes with a touch new by yeah. originality i mean it's not something duplicated okay something new something out of the box okay um maybe an example uh, we, you... we see something a new perspective a new perspective actually okay all right a new way a fresh a way of view, looking at a new me. perspective right okay all right so uh, yeah. there are innovative yes falguni innovative absolutely very interesting vinay when you say senses what do you mean by senses can you explain that a little more unpack that idea um basically i it's pushing the boundaries of our senses um mm-hmm. um i mean we our uh, we usually when we write we're limited to what we see feel touch smell so pushing the boundaries of what we what we sense you know mm-hmm. and uh, the interplay of what we don't sense and what we sense in that way okay yeah that's actually very interesting again because a lot of creativity is also about what is called the affect that when we read something it has a certain impression it creates a certain impression on our mind and there are cognitive researches on how these effects have a way of transforming and the way we even engage with the world around it which is why there is so much of emphasis on something like say art therapy when you're writing when you're narrativizing when you're telling stories and when you're trying to maybe even paint it's almost therapeutic because you are in a way externalizing your feelings and you're sort of trying to make sense of a lot of things that's going on in your head and that in fact deals with everything you've just said about fluidity the flow of thoughts because you're letting it out it's like a dam bursting and it comes out in some form or the other and when you are trying to be creative and you're not trying to stop that flow from coming the imagination comes out when the abstraction sort of comes in it really brings out a voice that innovation and that perspective of thinking out of the box a new way of looking at things uh but now i would like to ask you in that sense is there something that is about the content itself that you're dealing with or is it about the form is it about both that makes all these things happen will it be possible for instance to talk about something that no one has ever experienced in a completely innovative way you can type in the chat box also okay uh, can you repeat uh, what you are asking yeah so um i was asking what to what extent does form and content so there is a thought or there is something you're writing about or thinking about that can be innovative or fluid or imaginative and then there is a way a manner of presenting it which can also be fluid or out of the box or something that's completely new you've not really thought through where is the interplay between the two and which of these would possibly be more important um uh, as as for me i think it's all of that because uh, when i read uh, um hemingway's book right it's just uh, it's, it's just on the sea he's just like going on a boat but the way it's presented it's like it's very different it's like 
I am there on the scene and I could mm -hmm. feel everything that he was saying. It was like sort of detailed. So I think it's it's in the way of writing. Also, probably uh, the person who's going to say his story, right? The, the kind of uh, thing that he wants to make mm -hmm. uh, or say when he's writing is what I feel. I don't know. According to okay. me, that's what I feel. It's all of that. Okay. Uh, great. So I think there, there are a lot of ideas here right now. What we are going to do now is to try and unpack these ideas through a story. So I'm going to type, uh, I'm going to share a link on uh, the chat. Um, I would like you to go to the link and uh, there is a story on the link. So this is the link that you can sort of uh, click on and go to. It's a short story. It's called Yellow Fish. It's by uh, a Tamil writer called Ambai. It's translated into English. And uh, we are going to spend the next 10 minutes silently reading the story. I would like you to read it quietly to yourself. Think about it. And as you read the story, think about two things. What is the story about? And how do you know what it is about? So read the story and do it by yourself. I'll type the questions in the chat again. What is the story about? The first question. The second is, how do you know what it is about? So let's do that silently. We will uh, come back in at uh, 326, I guess. Please let me know if you're all able to access the story. Yes. Yes, uh, yes, Nirmala said something. No, ma'am.
<clears throat> well, I finished reading. And, uh, oh, okay. If everyone yeah. else has finished reading, maybe we no, can. No, no. I think uh, we may need to wait. We just uh, what we can do is, um, if you have finished reading, you can just uh, and what uh, whatever you are feeling at after reading that, you can just uh, type it in the chat. It will also give us a sense of how many of you have read, so that we can move ahead. So you can maybe post your thoughts and your responses to the que two questions itself. So maybe we'll just wait for another two or three minutes because it is a sort of a short story. So we can. Uh... Yeah, we'll wait for one or two minutes. Rachna has yeah. posted. Yeah, Anvi has yes. posted. We yes. would like to yeah. uh, more people to post on the chat, please. Yes, Rachna, it's it's about the child and comparing the child to a yellow fish, that little baby that um, that died and the little yellow fish that has been discarded. Yes, loss and an attempt to redeem grief, all right. It's about comparing Jalaja to the helpless yellow fish, absolutely, yes. Also think a little bit now about how is it, how it is that you have been able to get these ideas out of the story? What is it that story has done that has made you derive these inferences about it? It's beautifully expressed, of course, it's about redemption, all right. Uh, redemption of uh, what or who? Redemption of the narrator. Okay. And there is a feeling of guilt that he left, he let the child die. That mm. he could do nothing for a child. And so he feels redeemed when the yellow fish is returned to the sea. Okay. It's interesting that uh, you're uh, saying he. Is there any uh, specific um, instance in the story that uh, suggests that it's a he and not a she? Like, how can we, how do we know that it is a man and not a woman? No, I'm just curious again. So, the sea is considered an incubator, all right. And the uh, ashes as a desert, Jalaja as the fish, all right. Rachna is also talking about the beginning of the story, deals with the seaside. Yes, absolutely. Description of fishermen, their lives and adventures. So there's quite a lot that is coming here. What is it that is now giving you the sense of all of this? There is one story and there are so many different things that seem to have struck you individually that has made an impression and has sort of brought out these ideas. What do you think is actually happening in that creative piece that is leading you towards these questions and towards these kinds of responses. The descriptive language, absolutely, choice of words. Um, connections, yes. Uh, Rachna, do you want to push that idea a little further? What kinds of connections? See, like for example, mm -hmm. um, in the beginning when they have described about the fishermen sorting the fish, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. uh, how the fish is, uh, that yellow fish is opening its mouth and closing, gasping for breath, isn't it? And the same thing is uh, connected to the child. When the child was born, maybe the mm -hmm. delivery was uh, not a normal delivery and uh, the child uh, uh, is uh, described as, you know, uh, close, gasping. Uh, closing mm -hmm. and opening his mouth and then 
finally uh, through the language we realize that the child does could not live isn't it and uh, similarly like how the fish couldn't um, uh, survive and uh, it was thrown back into the she uh, sea or it was given to the person to be sent back to the sea That's and does the fish live after that i feel i feel it's lived i feel it lived which actually connects to the idea of redemption that there is one a uh, little life that was lost and then there is this alternate life that's actually survived and gained because it's sort of managed to survive that space and it's it's got that uh, alternate uh, uh, possibility which jalaja didn't have um so um, i i want yeah. to uh, yes. tell on the question you asked me and it's interesting that i didn't quite notice it the first time around now it seems to me that the person who is narrating it is anu mm. and um, because she stands outside the incubator watching the baby uh, gasp taking breaths try to live and then uh, she loses the baby and that's why there's such a strong connection between uh, the the baby is passing and then she watching the the fish mm. uh, actually taking trying to take in those deep breaths hmm uh otherwise the emotion wouldn't be so strong yeah yes absolutely and this actually then brings me to the next question of connections itself is it a one to one connection are they comparing jalaja with yellow fish with an equal to mark in the middle or is there something else that is happening so when uh this is actually one story that never ceases to amaze me because every time i go back to it i come away with something new or some um and this is something i feel is particularly remarkable about ambai as a writer that she is able to plumb so many depths with a few choice words the language that you have all spoken about the descriptions that you have all spoken about is so powerful and she is able to do this in such a nuanced creative manner and uh, so today for instance when i was rereading the story um there was one connection that i suddenly sort of realized i had not really thought about i'm not even sure whether it is a relevant connection or not but there is a difference also between jalaja and this little yellow fish jalaja was wanted she didn't make it even though she wanted she was uh, her parents wanted her she was uh, thought of as the child that is desired the yellow fish is thrown away the yellow fish is one of a discards where is that comparison and yet there is a connect and uh, i'm not sure whether that connection is resolved i'm not sure whether we even want to resolve it and these are some of the ways in which the the structure itself sort of comes into place which now makes me want to go back to what we started off earlier about this idea of fluidity of originality and a flow of ideas and it makes me want to ask then again for you to revisit that question say is creativity really about an unstructured flow or is there a very very powerful almost invisible structure that is there in that so called flow that is holding it together so when we are talking about connection um can we do one little exercise now i would like you all to go back to the story the link is right there and uh, look at specific passages read out point out the passages that made the maximum impact on your mind what is it so you can even start with the specific um, examples you've given about what the story is and try and locate little passage little bits in that story itself that made you think that way so yeah uh, janvi said loud racking uh, sobs the cloth was removed to reveal the urn's tiny mouth the ashes were in this very sea connecting the loss with the sea and the struggling fish yes yes janvi uh, this is uh, you say it's very telling what is it telling you
anyone else wants to uh, go, that's also fine. You can type the sections that you uh, want or even point out to particular pages. Will it help if I share my screen and have the story so that you can look at it? I can do okay. that if you want. No, no, I, uh, I've got it here. Okay. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. Thanks, Richie. Okay. Is my screen visible? Okay. Uh, yes. So let's maybe start with the first paragraph itself. What is that first stanza doing? What is the first paragraph doing? And how are you able to get a sense of, so one of you had said it's about the seaside, it's about the ocean and the way uh, the boats are coming in and life and the adventures of a fisherman. What is it about this paragraph that gives you that impression? Can you point out exact words? that are sort of making it that way, that make you think that way. It talks about, uh, it talks about a white boat arriving first, followed by the others, um, which are brightly colored, okay, uh, against uh, the sea. Mm -hmm. this, this, this does give us a kind of uh, indication that uh, the fishermen are rolling in towards the shore one after their catch. Okay. Um, what else is distinctive about these paragraphs? Anything? I think, uh, can I say? Yes, yes, Janabi, please go I ahead. I think that uh, sentence, away to the left of the shrunken sea and spent waves, the sand spreads like a desert. Mm -hmm. Shrunken sea and spent waves. I think that is very indicative of her own emotion. Okay. All right. The feeling shrunken, feeling spent mm -hmm. okay. uh, uh, with grief. So, All right. But do you know that, that really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. No, that's about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you know it? Do you know that this is what's going to happen when you start? No, it's only when you no, go back. And, no, no, yeah. not at all. Okay. You what don't can... know it, but then when you read that, when you read that sentence, there mm -hmm. is a kind of a, it appears to give an emotion that, you know, the sea is shrunken, that, that mm -hmm. imagery itself is a very dismal imagery. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And particularly... So the about... imagery gives you this uh, weariness. It kind of... it. it it's like a very evening, afternoon, I don't know. There's a weariness in the air is how it seems. It's like almost as if a, it's, it's, it's life as usual, but I'm, I'm wearied by it. I'm, I'm tired by it, something like that. Exactly. And I'm particularly happy about your choice of the term imagery. The, the story itself is actually very visual. Like if you look at the choice of words, the sand feels hot. It will not hold its wetness. We are talking about a beach and that's how dry it is. It's about the ice that is compelled by the sea alone. What is the color of the sea? It's blue and ash and gray. And then if you look at these particular thing about the fisherwomen, they're talking about bright colors, blinding indigo, demonic red, profound green, assaulting blue. The colors, there is almost a choice of words and every word that has been chosen for the story has been thought through. And uh, the colors are something that hit you in the eye. There is a vividness even in the way the whole description happens. Like you can almost paint this scene and imagine it in your mind. There is that level of imagism. There is definitely symbolism, but there's also description at the level of colors. Let's go back to that first question of grammar and structure. Is there any grammatical correct, grammatically correct sentence in that bright colors, blinding indigo, demonic red, profound green, assaulting blue? Suppose I were to rephrase this into a perfectly grammatically correct sentence that says, the, the colors on the beach were very brightly colored. There was an indigo that was almost blinding, a red that was demonic like a demon and the green was extremely profound and the blue assaulted your eye. Will it have the same effect as what they have just put down over here? 
there is a sense of vividness and the creativity that comes in when you are actually talking about the fluidity and the overflow of em emotions you are actually talking about an imagination going wild but you are pulling that imagination and you're keeping it completely under control this is not the work of an author who has gone out of control it's an author who's completely in control talking about an emotion that has gone out of control and there is that sense of control in almost every verse so even when we talk about structure for instance there is a connection between the sentences also and that particular line where we move from the mouth gasps gasps and closes it shudders and tosses on the hot sand the mouth closes closes and opens desperate for what as mouth too hasty in front jerja and then she sort of moves on and almost seamless connection from the present to the past and then back again to the present when at a later stage is talking about the ashes and then the connection of the ashes to the incubator and then the incubator bringing uh, and the sea and the ashes back in the sea and the yellow fish leaping around it is there's a lot of dynamism that is happening in the story and the dynamism in a way is happening through visuals it's happening through a very descriptive use of language it's happening by evoking those specific images in the mind that helps the reader uh, sort of follow the emotions of the protagonist themselves are there any other structures that are there that are drawing you into the story a question for you is this the work of the original author or is it a translator speaking uh yeah so that is also actually an interesting and important question uh this is uh, it was originally originally written in tamil it was called manjal me and it has been translated into english by lakshmi holstrom uh but lakshmi holstrom has also spent a lot of time translating uh, ambai's work in particular and it's a collaborative translation so generally when there is a translation between languages uh today in fact the act of translation is seen as a creative work in itself and uh, i'm also glad you asked this because there is quite a lot that is lost in the translation and uh, i'm just reading from a short preface that uh, holstrom writes to the story so she said i have translated the tamil title manjal mean literally as yellow fish although the freshness of the image remains i have lost the alliteration and the chiming of the soft consonants of the tamil in tamil the color name manjal is inseparable from the turmeric root from which it takes its name turmeric is one of the most auspicious of all ritual objects and most closely associated with women the main herb in ritual and daily baths and the primary spice in cooking uh if we have to take that element of yellowness as an almost cultural um, ritualistic yellowness as against just a color yellow fish there is an added level of symbolism that comes in which actually is lost in the translation because that uh, that little yellow fish is probably also an auspicious fish and the loss of jalaja is a loss of something much more profound than just a child so thank you for asking that because there are this is one of the ways these are some of the ways in which that creative writing evolves it evolves with the plain languages it evolves with the play of ideas and they are very tightly structured ideas uh it also evolves with the play of plot for instance so there are certain narrative actions that are happening it's a simple story and it is uh, it's it has a sequence of events and it's structured in a particular way and you're talking about it but there is a detailing also are we how do we know about anu's loss of child do we know because somebody is telling you you know what that that woman sort of lost her child and then threw a fish back into the ocean or are we being shown what happens uh these are actually some of the ways in which that creative process works so um what i think i would do now is uh, just run through a couple of core ideas that undergird the process of um uh, creative writing and uh, the principles that underlie creative writing in the first place and how they sort of um help in creating an affect 
or an effect on the audience to make that imagination something that can be structured and controlled. So just give me a minute. Um, are you able to uh, see my screen? Okay. So yeah, we can. Some, yeah, this is better. All right. So basically, uh, there are two or three main principles that underlie any act of creativity and creative writing in particular. The core idea under it is the idea of representation. So representation as a concept has multiple ways of interpreting it. It uh, can be a substitute. So when a representative in a parliament, for instance, is speaking in the place of somebody and they are talking about something and a story is a representation of say an experience or an emotion or reality. This is an idea that in fact underlies a lot of ideas about what realism means. You are coming as close to reality as possible. And uh, for a very long period of time, there have been people who have said that the mark of a good work is to be realistic. So if you see that picture on the side, that picture of Alice through the looking glass, the initial perception was always of art and creativity and creative writing as a mirror. It reflects your experience. And if you are able to capture your reality in a way that really comes close to your experience, then you're a good writer. And that really underlay quite a lot of uh, writing styles and techniques that people used in the initial stages of writing stories. But over a period of time, the idea of reflection started moving more towards creation as a representation. So I'm writing a story. It is creativity. It's about fluidity. It's about originality. It is about imagination. And I don't need to stick to that physical world that I already know about. I can talk about it as this second aspect of represent. Take something I have, change it. Present it in a different way the fresh perspectives that you all spoke about. There, there is fluidity, there's also a new innovation out of the box thinking. So this doesn't mean that the world we are talking about doesn't exist in the stories. It just means that it's been presented in a different way. And that actually then comes to the how element also of a creative writing piece, the most effective ones that are of cre uh, that are the most effective creative writing pieces are ones that don't tell you what to think. They show you and they let you think. There is a difference there because if I can tell you what I'm doing right now is telling you what to think. But suppose I do it in a different way and I try to do it hopefully in the different way in the earlier parts where I try to show you and help you experience what it means, there is possibly a greater chance of me convincing you. I'm not sure if you're convinced at all, that's a different letter level, but um, a lot of good writers and any good writer across the world, whether you're talking about Ruskin Bond, when you said he's talking and describing that natural environment, you love it because you feel you're right there. You can feel the cool breeze of Nanital. You can feel the hawkers on the street. You can actually smell the grass. That is the level of showing that happens in a really effective, powerful work. And that showing has a much greater effect, has a much greater buy-in at multiple levels, rather than simply being told. And that's about it because it doesn't convince me as well. And these ideas then work through this idea of world building. People have, um, Atwood has spoken about it, Gasset, Ortega, Gasset, Neil Gaiman, some of my favorite writers, of course, but almost every writer across the world, whether, and in India, Rushdie has spoken about the way his own magical realism, a novel like Midnight's Children or all the historical works he's written about, is really about building a world. There is a truth to that world. It may or may not be the truth of the world we inhabit. But there is a sanctity to the truth to that world. There is a coherence and a structure in that world. And you are following a narrative logic and a truth that belongs to that world alone. And for that world building, the most important concrete element, which actually any of us can do, is observation and detailing. To be able to observe every leaf, every blade of grass in that world, to be able to see a little spider spinning a web in that world or that little shanty house that you're setting your story in, 
to be able to capture the characteristics. So one of you had actually typed in loud racking sobs. There is a certain rawness to that pain. And that pain comes because a word like racking loud sobs is used. I'm not just telling you that Anu is really upset and she's weeping outside looking at the little child. I'm showing you that in the process of building this world, Anu is a mother who has lost a little baby. She probably wanted a lot. We don't know. We are inferring this. But we are able to infer this through three well-chosen words. Words that are capturing the very, very innate psychological details of her emotions. The very innate feelings that she may have. So at the end of two pages, I have no clue who Anu is. I don't know whether she's married to Arun, whether Arun is her brother or her uncle or anybody else. But I know her intimately enough to know the pain she's gone through. That's happened because of the detail. And that entire story works as one consolidated whole. That's the other point of a world. If there is one sentence in a story, one of the most important things that uh, people say in creative writing workshops is, do you really love this word? Do you really like this line? Delete it. You can't have one line that rules over the story at the cost of the entire story. What needs to happen is that whole world to exist for itself. The building and the word blocks have to come together to hold it together. And that really happens to the extent to which you can start observing. So you're probably doing like one big love, rough draft of the story. And you're looking at that story and you're sort of saying, okay, there's a character sketch here. And then you kind of go into the details. Who is this character? Do I know anything about Arun? Do any of us know anything about Arun? We probably know that he's a concerned well-wisher. He is confused. He doesn't know how to deal with Anu who is grief-stricken, who herself doesn't know how to deal with herself. And even with like one sentence of Arun's confused dialogue, we are able to infer something about him. But then again, the story is not about Arun, it's about Anu. So we then shift focus there. But there is that innateness of detailing at the level of action, at the level of plot, at the level of story organization of events. What comes first? What comes next? Should I push the, uh, perhaps the incubator scene to the first? No, maybe I should just start with the scene. And these are calculated decisions that come with draft after draft of writing at one point, effect and the ability to be able to talk about an emotion being really at the core of it. So there is always an idea they start with. And then there's a world that is built around the idea. So why is it all important? Maybe that's an instrumental question we need to reflect on to create an imaginative answer, perhaps. So um, what I will do is I will stop here and maybe we can have a discussion. I can take questions. We have another 10 minutes. So, I, yeah. I believe, I believe there's something that is uh, very critical about the story, uh, Ms. Shavita, and um, something that stands out. Now, you and possibly every one of us on this forum are able to relate to it because we are Indians. Okay. When you write a story, um, one of the most important aspects is that if you want that to be read and understood by uh, people from other cultures, the relatability of that, because you know, someone living in Mexico or in Canada may not be able to relate to that. And that's where simplicity comes in. Yes. The, the yes. trick is not in complicated language. Yes. It's in how simple one can be. Exactly. To get the ideas across. And I believe that's the trick that writers do when they cut across cultures. Otherwise, I wouldn't understand a thing about what, what they say. Exactly. That is absolutely true. Uh, because that is also what makes it more, not just accessible, there is another element that I would add to the idea of simplicity, 
Uh, this is in fact something that is debated in literary circles itself. There is one group that believes that there is nothing like universal truths because we live in a world where our experiences are situated and almost everything from gender questions to post-coloniality or whether we are Indians or Americans or Africans, can I actually identify with any of it? Would say, no, you can never understand what this whole essence of being a woman or a man or an African means. There is that one aspect and yet, and then there are these, uh, another group of people from uh, say world literature perspectives who would say that, you know, hey, it's yes, there is a situatedness and we need to be sensitive to it. But when we are talking about say grief or pain or human emotions caused because of certain situated uh, sensitive context specific experiences, those pains can be related and relatable if we are able to capture it in exactly what you just said, in a simple language that decides your theme. So if I want to talk about the, war, the pain of war, I may not expect people to understand what a partition means, but perhaps I can get them to explain what it means for families to be torn apart in a different context. So that metaphor of maybe a child lost with a yellow fish or the loss of a Syrian refugee with a partition refugee because there are two families that go comparing. And that's also really where the creativity of the imagination and construction comes. Because what you're probably doing is not just reflecting an existing experience that's out happened outside, but constructing a new idea or a vision or perspective of understanding that experience by maybe bringing two incomparable things together. And you're making it pressure you are giving an alternative way of approaching that experience. So it's a, um, that's actually, so thanks for bringing that up because that language use is precisely the, the crux of it. And uh, translating it is extremely difficult. It's like translating a culture. And there is, that's in fact, again, something that uh, there are debates on which uh, very recently, I think two, three years ago, is when they instituted translations as a creative writing exercise. It's not just like you're not piggybacking on someone else, you're actually creating something new. So it always happens with a certain dialogue and a negotiation with people. Um, Absolutely, oh. uh, I can relate to that. Uh, when I was in France, we were translating French work to a uh, French software. And <laughs> we had a, something called a statement of work and that's shortened to SOW. It's a common term that we use in the corporate circles. And the translator obviously doesn't know it. And so it translated that into Tui. And Tui in French is female pig. And we were going to send it to the customer. And luckily, uh, the, my French colleague read it and caught it right there yeah, instead of sending an, an invoice which said by the way this is female pig number 101 <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how we would have controlled that so translation is so important uh, it can't be automated always that's something that in fact has come up quite often in this netflix series emily in paris it's quite hilarious when they when you look at the experiences. Yeah, um, Ruchi has just shared a feedback form, so please do um, yeah take the time to fill it out. And uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to share my screen once again for something that's probably more exciting than me. Uh, to uh, just a second, there is another story here that I would like you to read. It's a very short one will barely take you two minutes. And now I would like you to sort of um, read it and comment on what you think about it. Nisha, can you just uh, zoom in a bit? Is this better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but this means I might have to scroll down a bit. Take it. Hold it on. Yeah. Just tell me if you want me to scroll down. So I have uh, posted feedback form. You can also fill that up later. Oh, 
Okay, <laughs> thank you. I know, just hold on. Is this okay? So this is actually another writer who writes brilliantly. And um, so, yeah, what are your thoughts about this? What do you think is happening at the level of holding the creative creative process together through a bunch of words? Well-chosen words. Uh, ma'am, may I? Yes, yes, of course, Achyut. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, ma'am, to me, it seems like something I could tell a student. Uh, depends on my audience, right? I could tell this to even small kids or to mm-hmm. even adults and everyone would perceive it their own way. And this is really brilliant. Why do you think that's so? Because adults would relate it to in such a way that our lives have become monotonous and kids would see it as something that they should strive to not become. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is also one more uh, interesting bit over here. So when we were talking earlier about structures and imagination, um, The fluidity also comes when you think of it from the perspective of a fable. So this is, uh, if you want, I'll just give you the link. I think I'll post the link here so you can look at it yourself too. Uh, There is a lot of times when you are writing within a tradition or if it's a short story or if it is a theater piece or if it's a poem or whatever it is, there is a baggage to what the particular tradition can do. And uh, this particular writer has used the form of the fable. He, it, the, it's titled Two Fables. And it immediately takes you back to the idea of the Panchatantra and the fabular form and the instructive underlying uh, assumption behind the fables. So your fox and the rat and the mouse or whatever it is you're doing, they're there to teach a certain value. And then when you read it in that framework of a fable, Here is another interesting way in which this play of existing traditions with a new imagination, with contemporary reality comes together to disrupt and maybe get you to think about what. So I think I'll stop there then. And uh, Ruchi, over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Nishevita. It was a really uh, engaging discussion uh, that we have had on these stories. And both the stories that you shared were very uh, thought-provoking. And uh, the, the way the ideas were conveyed is really int- very interesting. I hope it will inspire people to look uh, more uh, reflectively and thoughtfully at uh, the creative writing process itself. And if people are interested um, to engage with it in a more systematic way, uh, maybe have a meeting once a month uh, on the, this idea, then please do write up uh, in the feedback form. So if you indicate your interest in the feedback form and if there is enough interest generated, uh, then we might um, uh, float some sort of a regular program to engage in the creative writing thinking process. Nishi, anything you want to add about this? Uh, Yeah, so we can think of a more sustained engagement over some of the principles itself. So we've uh, practically covered an overview of things like language, the use of plot, characters, metaphors, literary devices, and the rest. Uh, Each of it is a concept in itself that can be plumbed much more deeper. And uh, I think what I really did was touch on some ideas and think of a more overarching principle which drives quite a lot of creative writing in enterprises. The sessions, if we want, if it can be a much longer session, a longer series of engagements over several months, maybe once a month, over say 10 months the next year, where we pick on one idea, like maybe a plot. What does it mean to structure a plot and what effect it has? maybe characters, voice, perspective, and each of these sessions will deal with one idea in much deeper detail, and that can be planned over a period of time. So please do indicate if you would be interested in that, and we can work towards that. So uh, thanks again, uh, Nishi. Thanks, Sandhya. I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, today's session, and uh, uh, you have uh, work through other sessions also. Uh, this is the last session of this year that oh. we are holding. Next week uh, we are on holiday. 
so we will be back to you in 2021 with a new set of uh, workshop series and uh, if you are interested in any topic that you feel uh, that should be taken up in these workshops uh, please do indicate in the feedback form we will uh, have a look at it and uh, see if we can accommodate it uh, within our list itself so once again uh, nishavita thanks a lot uh, for coming here and uh, spending time with all of us and having such a interesting and invigorating uh, discussion with us. Thanks, Ruchi. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So by then, uh, we will see you in 2021. Yeah. Merry Christmas yeah. and have a happy new year, all of you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. You too. Bye. I hope you have filled up the feedback form. We'll just stay on for just one or two more minutes in case you need that link. Uh, hi, we can Yeah, hi, hi Janvi. Uh, yeah. In that feedback form, there is something called option one. What is that? Uh, that must be some sort of a mistake. Uh, just okay. ignore that. Okay. Because, uh, okay. That's the way uh, the Google form is created. No, the, some question is there. Then option one is there by default. Must be a mistake. Okay, thank you. Just ignore. Uh, so we can switch off our uh, cameras, uh, Nishi, and I'll uh, log off in a few minutes.